If you were a high status NFL player, would you know if there was something horrific and illegal happening in the home you pay for? Is sexual harassment just the norm for women working in the NFL? Are teams throwing games and using blackhead coaches as scapegoats? The NFL isn't just about the big games, it's also about the big scandals. The NFL had quite a few big stories over the years, but the 2020s seem to be absolutely full of them. And some have even caused the United States government to get involved. So what's going on with the NFL? Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati. And in our last episode on the NFL, we talked about the NFL's history and their multiple scandals around domestic violence, CTE, and racial discrimination. However, with an organization that has a 100 year history and seemingly has a new problem every single week, that episode merely scratched the surface. So today we're going to go into a little bit more detail and catch up on some of the recent big news. We're going to cover some pretty tough topics like sexual harassment, sexual assault, and dogfighting. So if those things might be a little too difficult for you to hear right now, feel free to skip this episode in its entirety. With all of that being said, let's get right into it. I talked a little bit about the background of the NFL in the last episode, but I want to get more into the structure of the organization and their owners. So the NFL currently has 32 teams and is split into two conferences, the American Football Conference and the National Football Conference. Unlike other companies, no one person owns the NFL. Instead, the NFL has multiple owners. The best way to describe it is each NFL franchise owner owns part of the bigger entity, which is the NFL. Some of these brands or teams have multiple owners while others only have one. There is one exception to this rule, and that is actually the Green Bay Packers, who are a publicly owned franchise in the NFL, and Green Bay Packers Inc. is considered a nonprofit and has been since 1923. Because there is not just one singular owner of the NFL, each team selects a representative for the executive committee, which makes decisions on policy changes. While some people believe that Roger Goodell, commissioner of the NFL, is the owner of the organization, he is not. Instead, he makes quick decisions, approves some policy changes, and runs the daily operations for the league on behalf of the owners and the executive committee. Additionally, while the players do have their own association called the National Football League Players Association, they do not have any representatives in the executive committee. They can object to policies or input their opinions, but ultimately new policies are under the discretion of the owners and the owners only. Now, all of this is important to think about while we talk about things like Brian Flores' lawsuit or other instances of controversy for the league. While the first step may be to blame Goodall, it's important to remember technically the owners are his bosses and oftentimes it's them making the decisions, not him. This isn't always true as we'll see in the case of Michael Vick, but the owners ultimately make decisions on the coaches they hire and the policies that are enforced. Keep in mind of that when we get to Brian Flores. Now, with that being said, let's get into one of the biggest news stories of the NFL, Mike Vick. Michael Vick's introduction to the league is already pretty historic. Pick first in the 2001 NFL draft by the Atlanta Falcons, Vick would become the first black quarterback in NFL history taken first in the draft. Before long, Vic was making waves in the NFL. By 2004, he became the highest paid player with a $130 million contract. Then in 2006, he was the first quarterback in the league's history to rush for 1,000 yards in a single season. However, just one year after he broke records and introduced the idea and giant possibility of success of a running quarterback to the league, it all came crashing down. In April, 2007, police served their first search warrant on a house owned by then quarterback phenomenon, Michael Vick. The search warrant was originally sparked after Vic's cousin, David Boddy, had been arrested on drug charges and listed Vic's home as his primary residence. When police showed to search the home, they were met with a shocking discovery. 66 dogs in painted black buildings behind the house. Following the discovery, police would search the house multiple times. And after interviewing Vic and three other men, they discovered the horrific truth. This was the home of a dog fighting ring by the name of Bad News Kennels, and it had been operating at Vic's home for five years. After this, Vic was adamant that he had no idea about a dog fighting ring and was rarely at the house. But three months following the initial warrant, Vic and three other men were indicted by a grand jury with multiple charges related to dog fighting, including 
breeding and training fighting dogs, hosting dog fights, killing dogs considered unable to fight and traveling out of state for dog fights. Vic's name was mentioned an astonishing 48 times throughout the indictment and he was facing six years in prison and $350,000 in fines if incarcerated. That same month, Nike decided to pause the release of a new line of Vic's footwear, Air Zoom Vic 5. Only one day after Vic's shoe line was suspended, protesters from the People of Ethical Treatment of Animals or PETA appeared outside the NFL headquarters. They were urging that the NFL sack Vic or fire him. Protesters also emerged at the Falcons training facility holding signs of dogs that read dogfighting victim, Falcons tackle cruelty, and even a sign that said kick Vic. Among the controversy, league commissioner Roger Goodell ordered Vic to skip the Falcons training camp. However, Vic was still paid in light of his absence. He was also encouraged the Falcons to avoid disciplining Vic in any way while the NFL completed a review. Goodell wrote to Vic saying, "'While it is for the criminal justice system to determine your guilt or innocence, it is my responsibility as commissioner of National Football League to determine whether your conduct, even if not criminal, nonetheless violates league policies, including the personal conduct policy. Not everyone was happy with this course of action, including the Falcons owner, Arthur Blank. According to him, he was ready and planning on taking disciplinary action against Vic, but was stopped by the NFL commissioner. In a statement released to reporters, Blank said, "'This was our position today. We asked for a four game suspension. Obviously we are comfortable with Michael not being in training camp. Depending on circumstances as they develop, we'll make a decision. We'll decide the future if Michael will play during this year or not. And honestly, it's a little bit interesting to see that a team asked for the two game suspension for Vic's actions, but a two game suspension for Ray Rice for abusing his fiance at the time is like, like that's not gonna happen. Now, both deserve suspensions or to be banned from the NFL, but the fact that both the abuse of women and the abuse of animals comes with such minimal consequence from the league or from the owners is it's kind of horrific. It would probably be more useful to suspend people until the end of their investigations, but that does not seem to be the, like, that's not what the NFL is about. They're just kind of like, oh yeah, like, sure, he may have beat his fiance or sure, he might be killing dogs, but like, we don't know. Like, I don't know, it's just, it's not cute. It's not quirky. It's kind of disgusting. Now, Vic's argument that he didn't know about the dog fighting in his home was quickly unraveled as the criminal proceedings continued. Despite him pleading not guilty at his first court appearance, his co-defendants did not follow suit. Instead, all three pled guilty and said Vic had been involved. They told the court that Vic had traveled with them to dog fights and said he was involved in executing approximately eight dogs that did not perform well in testing sessions. Only six days later, Vic officially pled guilty for his involvement in dog fighting, but denied he had ever bet on fights. He only bankrolled them. Following his guilty plea, Vic was almost immediately suspended, please note not banned by the NFL indefinitely without pay. Goodell released a letter he wrote to Vic on the NFL website, which read in part, your admitted conduct was not only illegal, but also cruel and reprehensible. Your team, the NFL and NFL fans have all been hurt by your actions. Vic was officially sentenced on December 10th, 2007 to 23 months in prison with three years of supervised release. And just as a quick reminder, he was originally facing six years. So as far as prison sentences go, he got off a little easy. But anyway, in addition, he was also ordered to pay a $5,000 fine and was ordered to pay over $900,000 in restitution for the care of 53 pit bulls who had been seized from his property. While you may think this is the last time we would hear from the NFL and Michael Vick in the same sentence, you would be wrong. So let's fast forward to 2009. After serving his 23 month sentence, Vick returned to the NFL conversation. After a four hour meeting with the commissioner, Vick was conditionally reinstated with the league. Goodall said in a conference, I believe he is sincere in his remorse. He recognizes what he was engaging in was horrific and cruel. He wanted an opportunity to prove that was not Michael Vick. He really didn't focus significantly on the loss of career and the loss of money. And if I'm just gonna butt in and insert myself for a moment here, that's um, that's not the best statement. The problem wasn't so much that he didn't think about his career. I mean, clearly he didn't think about his career, but that wasn't the problem here. The problem was that he didn't think about the dogs, how they were just meaninglessly killed and how he was breaking the law. Anyway, after his reinstatement, Vic was picked up by the Eagles for a small, by NFL standards, contract of $2 million, none of which was guaranteed. This news was met with a mixed reaction from Eagles fans. One fan Reagan told the NY Times, I cried, now I have to hate the Eagles. Now I don't have a team to root for anymore. There's no possible way I could ever root for them again. It makes me sick. 
Another man named Kevin told the New York Times that he had offered on Facebook to buy out season ticket holders who were giving up on the team. He believed Vic deserved a second chance and said, "'I'm not condoning what he did. It's a horrible thing, but he served time in federal prison. He lost out on the benefit of having a multi-million dollar contract with the Falcons. He's in bankruptcy.'" An author, John Maximuk, wrote three separate books about the Eagles and said that reactions from people who called in on talk radio were very strongly negative. Despite the polarization, Vic would remain on the team. Then two years later, he would sign a $100 million contract with the Eagles with 40 million guaranteed. Now, serving your time and then returning to your life should be the way it works, but there's no denying that Vic got off easy compared to many other people that served time in prison for various crimes. While many other people can come back with freedom with barriers that stop them from voting, finding housing and gaining employment, Vic was able to come back to his job and get $100 million within two years. That same year, he would release a book titled Finally Free and went on a media tour to promote it. And Vic said, "'The day I saw that first dog fight, something changed. I didn't know dogs could react the way they did. I know it may seem contradictory, but that's just the person that I was. On one hand, I love dogs. On the other hand, I was in love with the competition behind it. For some reason, I couldn't really see the meaning behind it. You can only go on what you see at such a young age. And I just fell into a trap and started believing what I wanted to believe. There was never a point at which someone tried to correct me and tell me it was wrong. Regardless of how you might feel about Vic, he has come back to the NFL and his career has continued on. Today, Vic is a spokesperson for animal rights and has worked in broadcasting and in the NFL. His past still haunts him as he has told the Washington Post. I hate it. I think about that more than all the good years and the good times. Shit, it hurt my chances of going to the Hall of Fame. It's going to impact everything, but it was all self-inflicted. I was young. I didn't have no guidance. I didn't use this as no excuse. I could have said no. I could have made those right decisions like this ain't for me. That's a blemish that I will never be able to erase. But the stain of his actions, the NFL's reactions when it first happened and the controversy of his return continue to be one of the biggest stories in NFL history and will likely remain that way forever. But as I mentioned earlier in the first episode on the NFL, we found that they are not lacking in public scandal and the 2020s have been full of them. Starting with the very public investigation of the Washington Commanders, formerly the Washington football team, formerly the Redskins. So before we dip into that and taking a look at Dan Snyder and various forms of sexual harassment, let's go ahead and put today's sponsor here because afterwards it's gonna get a little rough if you didn't think this first part was rough. It's gonna get rougher. So sponsor break and then you've been warned. If you're looking to cook more at home and treat yourself and your family to fantastic recipes without the stress of meal planning them, then look no further than HelloFresh. And that's because HelloFresh delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients to your door. Skip the trip to the grocery store, no more waiting in long lines and no more wasting money on excess food. And HelloFresh is flexible because our lives are constantly changing and you can customize your orders super easily, change your delivery day, your food preferences, plan size, or skip a week whenever you need it. Plus, HelloFresh is gonna save you money. It's apparently 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality. And on average, you can save over $65 a month when you order HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping. And one of the things I love about HelloFresh is now that I'm becoming a little more comfortable with cooking, it's starting to push me outside of my comfort zone. Like I'm starting to pick meals and things that I would never dream of being able to create and starting to actually make them in the kitchen and eat them and then they taste good too. And I'm like, whoa, there's like, I did this? Like, I'm kind of proud of myself. So if you wanna get started on your your cooking journey, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 16 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash casket16 with code casket16. This episode is also sponsored by Daily Harvest because maybe you're not in the mood to cook. Maybe you just wanna take things back a little bit easier and maybe you just want some really delicious smoothies. Well, Daily Harvest has got you covered. And Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbreads, of course, smoothies, ice cream, lattes, uh, overnight oats, and more. And it's all built on organic fruits and vegetables and it comes right to your door and it conveniently stays fresh in your freezer. Now you guys know I'm an absolute addict for their smoothies. I have one almost every single morning Uh, I've gone back to the classics a little bit. They have like a strawberry banana and I don't know, maybe it's because it's been snowing again in Colorado, but something about strawberry banana or pineapple and mango and papaya, like those kinds of more fruity tropical smoothies, like they taste so good when it's so cold out. 
And Daily Harvest takes only a couple minutes to prepare, by the way. They don't use preservatives, added sugars, artificial anything. So you get food that's good for you with minimal effort. So if you wanna try what makes Daily Harvest amazing, make sure you go to dailyharvest.com slash casket and get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash casket for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash casket. Let's just start by talking about the names and briefly discuss the whole mess. In a statement released by the team on July 2020, they said, on July 3rd, we announced the commencement of a thorough review of the team's name. Today, we are announcing that we will be retiring the Redskins name and logo upon completion of this review. This decision comes after decades of people asking for the team to change the name from the racist offensive word for indigenous people that they have been using. After the team announced the change, the Navajo Nation released a statement saying, July 23rd, 2020 is now a historic day for all indigenous peoples around the world as the NFL Washington-based team officially announced the retirement of the racist and disparaging Redskins team name and logo. For generations, this team name and logo has misrepresented the true history and events that define the term Redskins. The name change came as a slight shock since Dan Snyder, the team owner since 1999, had previously said they would never change the name and thought it honored Native Americans. The team then went into the 2021 season with a very creative name, the Washington football team. Then finally, after 18 months with the most generic name in history, they released the new name, the Commanders. While the name change was a long time coming, it wasn't even close to the biggest story related to the DC team. The big story is much, much worse and includes a massive investigation on the team's history and widespread sexual harassment. It all started in July, 2020 with the release of a bombshell article by the Washington Post called From Dream Job to Nightmare. In it, the Post details the near constant sexual harassment faced by women working within the organization. Over 15 women at the time had accused multiple executives of sexual harassment and detailed a toxic, sexist culture they were met with when they finally accomplished their goal of getting what they thought would be their dream job. Unfortunately, I won't have time to go through every single one of the allegations in detail, but I will get into a brief overview of what happened. In short, multiple executives of the team were accused of sexually harassing women working for the organization. Harassment would go from verbally abusing them, including calling women, quote, fucking stupid, uh, asking questions about whether a woman's breasts were real or fake, constant comments on their looks, and multiple instances of inappropriate sexual advances. One woman, Emily Applegate, said working for the team was the most miserable experience of my life. Emily Applegate was the only woman who spoke to the Post publicly. The remaining 14 spoke with the condition that they have complete anonymity. Why? Because they were worried about litigation because they had signed non-disclosure agreements with the team that threatened legal retribution if they spoke negatively about the club. The Post requested the Roman be released from these agreements so they could speak freely, but the team said no. Upon hearing that the Post would be releasing the story, Dan Snyder declined any request to be interviewed and promptly released a statement saying the team has hired Beth Wilkinson and the firm Wilkinson Wash to quote, conduct a thorough independent review of this entire matter and help the team set new employee standards for the future. I'm sure the team hoped this would put an end to the whole thing, but far from it, it only got worse from there. Just a few days after Wilkinson took a hold of an independent investigation on the team, the organization and their absolutely toxic, allegedly, environment she stumbled into was a shocking discovery. Dan Snyder had a decade old allegation of sexual misconduct against him, which he successfully kept secret with a $1.6 million settlement. After learning this, Wilkinson went to talk to the woman about the previous allegation and was met by a brick wall by the very person that hired her. According to the woman's lawyer, Brendan Sullivan, Snyder's lawyer had tried to offer her even more money to convince her not to talk to Wilkinson. Snyder's attorney denied this happened and A. Scott Bolden released a statement saying, untrue, it did not happen. Absolutely no effect was made by me or any Reed Smith lawyers to dissuade anyone from speaking with Beth Wilkinson or otherwise cooperating with her investigation, nor was any money offered to anyone to cooperate. Anyone suggesting something to the contrary is lying. Then in August, 2020, the Post released another article detailing Dan Snyder's involvement in the toxic workplace culture. This included stories of a highly inappropriate and invasive video made of the cheerleaders during the shooting of the swimsuit calendar. The video, which was taken without the knowledge of the cheerleaders, includes moments where their breasts were exposed while adjusting their suits and changing positions. Larry Michael, the senior vice president, referred to the video as the good bits, according to a former staff member, and allegedly told the employees to make the video specifically for Dan Snyder. 
Both Snyder and Michael denied that this was true and Snyder wrote that he did not have any knowledge of the 10 year old videos. That same month, the NFL announced that they would be taking over the responsibilities of overseeing the investigation. I do not see any way that a, um, a team can do its own investigation of itself. But the Washington Post alleges that Dan Schneider repeatedly tried to impede the investigation. According to the Washington Post, Snyder's lawyers attempted to identify the former employees that spoke in the first article. Remember those same employees that wouldn't let out their names because of the NDA? He was trying to find their names. Additionally, private investigators working for Snyder allegedly showed up at former employees' homes or relatives' homes uninvited multiple times while the investigation was ongoing. Though with that being said, pretty much all we know about the investigation is that it resulted in a $10 million fine for the team in July, 2021. Goodell found at the end of the review that the team had operated both generally and particularly for women in a highly unprofessional manner. He released a statement that thanked Wilkinson and her team for conducting the review and providing recommendations based on her findings. That statement read in part, Beth and her team performed their work in a highly professional and ethical manner. Most importantly, I want to thank the current and former employees who spoke to Beth and her team. They provided vital information that will help ensure that the workplace environment of the club continues to improve. It is incredibly difficult to relieve painful memories. I am grateful to everyone who courageously came forward. This announcement came after Tanya Snyder, Dan's wife, had been renamed to co-CEO and assumed responsibility for the day-to-day operations of the organization. The NFL announced that the $10 million fine would be used charitably and support organizations committed to character education, anti-bullying, healthy relationships, and related topics. Dan Snyder released a statement saying, I have learned a lot in the past few months about how my club operated and the kind of workplace that we had. It is now clear that the culture was not what it should be, but I did not realize the extent of the problems or the role in allowing that culture to develop and continue. I know that as the owner, I am ultimately responsible for the workplace. I have said that and I say it again. Despite all of this, apart from leaked emails by former Raiders head coach, John Gruden, which consisted of sexist and racist language causing him to leave the league, the NFL has kept the results of their investigation secret. As the Washington Post points out, this is a bit odd, especially considering the NFL had released detailed reports about their investigations into Ray Rice, Deflategate, and Jerry Richardson, the owner of the Carolina Panthers. Additionally, Wilkinson had apparently given the report orally instead of writing it down, which again is odd. But with the NFL finding the team and reports nowhere to be found for a short period of time, this felt like the close of the situation. Surely this would be end of the scandal for the team, right? Nope, it gets worse again. Remember how I said it was a little odd that the NFL didn't release the results of the investigation? Well, it turns out I'm not the only one who thought that too. Congress also thinks so. Two weeks after the leak of John Gruden's emails in October, 2021, two Democrats sent a letter to Goodell requesting that the league provide the results of their investigation into the organization. They also requested that the NFL explain the role they played in the investigation and explain why they were refusing to release the report. They wrote in the letter to the NFL, "'We have serious concerns about what appears to be widespread abuse of workplace conduct at the WFT and about the NFL's handling of this matter.'" Communications between league management and WFT leadership also raises questions about the league's asserted impartiality in these investigations. Brian McCarthy, a spokesperson for the NFL, responded by saying that the league looked forward to speaking with the chairwoman who wrote the letter. Then in early February, 2022, Congress held a round table at Capitol Hill to discuss toxic workplaces and toxic workplace culture in the Washington Commanders organization. During the discussion, Tiffany Johnston, a former employee who had worked for the organization for eight years, described an instance of sexual harassment from team owner, Dan Snyder. In her statement, she recounted a story that Snyder had placed his hand on her thigh under the table and later with his hand on Johnston's lower back, pushed her aggressively towards his limo and asked her to ride with him. She said, I learned that the only reason Dan Snyder removed his hand from my back and stopped pushing me toward his limo is because his attorney intervened and said, Dan, Dan, this is a bad idea. Five other women also participated in the roundtable discussion and all of them gave detailed accounts of their experiences of sexual harassment and verbal abuse during their employment. The former director of marketing and client relations, Rachel Engelson told Congress, I can't recall a time that I didn't experience or fear sexual harassment. It was just a pervasive part of the culture and unavoidable rite of passage being a woman who worked there. However, Dan Snyder released a statement to NPR where he called the allegations against him outright lies and said, 
I unequivocally deny having participated in any such conduct at any time and with respect to any person. Following the roundtable, Congress again requested more files from the initial investigation and called for new investigations on Dan Snyder. On February 4th, 2022, the Congressional Oversight Committee sent a letter to the NFL asserting that the NFL had withdrawn from a common interest agreement with the commander's organization as a quote, justification to avoid turning over key documents that the committee is seeking. The NFL responded with a letter saying that they had asked the commanders to allow the release of the documents, but had been denied. They blamed the team for blocking the NFL's access to over 100,000 documents related to the investigation. However, the commanders denied this, and one of Snyder's lawyers released a statement saying, the commanders have never prevented the NFL from obtaining any non-privileged documents and will not do so in the future. Then the Washington commanders announced that they had again hired their own investigator to look into the accusations by Tiffany Johnston against Dan Snyder. This time, maybe because they had learned from the first investigation, the NFL quickly stepped in. Brian McCarthy, a league spokesman, released a statement saying, Last week, the league stated that we will review and consider Ms. Johnston's allegations as we would regarding any workplace conduct at the Washington Commanders. The league, not the team, will conduct an independent investigation and will be retaining an investigator to determine the facts shortly. At this point, over 40 women have come out against the team. Recently, a movement called Boycott Dan has begun to email sponsors of the team in an attempt to get sponsors to pull their support for the commanders. The website Boycott Dan requests that fans email corporate sponsors and provides a drafted email that can be used by the fans that read in part. Mr. Snyder has engaged in inappropriate and potentially illegal activities, including the sexual abuse and assault of female employees. Your corporations or companies continued association with Mr. Snyder and the commanders will force me, my family, and my friends to use sponsor's biggest competitor, services or products instead. As this case is massive and continues to evolve, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Will Snyder be forced to sell the team? Will they ever release documents from the first investigation? The answer is we'll see. But now that we've gone through what seems to be the never ending saga of the Washington commanders, NFL and Congress, let's talk about the newest bombshell for the league, the Brian Flores lawsuit. Morals cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. The law cannot make an employer love me, but it can keep him from refusing to hire me because of the color of my skin. This quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the first things written on the bombshell class action complaint filed by Brian Flores on February 1st, 2022. The core of the lawsuit was one pervasive issue in the NFL, which I've talked about previously, racial discrimination. First, let me just take you all through a little bit of background that gave way to the current situation. By the end of the 2021 season, the Dolphins, who had been coached by Flores for three years, ended their season with a winning record. No one would have suspected that after the head coach had accomplished the historic feat of bringing a losing team to a winning record that he would get fired. But unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. After being fired from his position as head coach, Flores embarked on a journey to find a new job with a new team which as I discussed from the last episode can be jarring and a difficult endeavor for any black coach looking for a new position. In the complaint, they described the statistics for black NFL coaches as of February 1st. There was only one black head coach, four black offensive coordinators and 11 black defensive coordinators. And this is out of 32 teams in total where the players are 70% black. Additionally, the complaint lists multiple quotes from NFL executives acknowledging the lack of diversity in high-ranking coaching positions in the NFL and the league's history of race-based testing in their concussion and dementia settlements. But the biggest bombshells of the lawsuit came from Flores' accusations against three different teams, the Dolphins, the Broncos, and the Giants. Flores first accused the owner of the Dolphins, Stephen Ross, of offering to pay him $100,000 for every loss. And the general manager, Chris Guerriere, had allegedly told him that Flores' success as a head coach was compromising the team's draft position. Just to explain this a little bit further, the worse a team is, the better their draft picks are in the next season. So allegedly, the Dolphins were trying to bribe Flores to risk his career as a head coach since black head coaches rarely get a second chance in the NFL so that they could just get better draft picks the next season. Ultimately, when Flores was fired, the Dolphins portrayed a narrative that he was just difficult to work with. Flores, after filing the complaint, said in an interview with NPR that he thought he was fired because he refused to throw games. Flores said, I wouldn't do the things they wanted me to do. From a character and integrity standpoint, there was no way I was going to tank. Ultimately, I think that's why, or I know that's why. Then after being fired from his job with the Dolphins, Flores was set up to go interview with another team, the Giants. 
If hired, he would be the first black head coach in the Giants franchise history. But unbeknownst to him, the Giants had already made their decision and were planning to hire Brian DeBall before even completing the interview. That is, until a texting mishap by Patriots head coach Bill Belichick happened. Belichick texted Flores congratulating him on landing the job saying, I hear from Buffalo and New York Giants that you are their guy. I hope it works out if you want it to. The only problem is that Flores hadn't even interviewed for the position yet. In the following text message, Flores asked him if he had meant to text him or Brian DeBall. It was here that I'm sure Belichick realized he had made a terrible mistake and he responded, sorry, I fucked this up. I double checked and misread the text. I think they are naming DeBall. I'm sorry about that. After learning this, Flores still attended the interview. The interview, as the complaint reads, was held for no reason other than for the Giants to demonstrate falsely to the league commissioner, Roger Goodell, and the public at large that it was in compliance with the Rooney Rule. In other words, the interview was a sham and was only used to demonstrate that the team had met the Rooney Rule's requirement of interviewing at least one minority head coach from outside the franchise. Flores alleges in the complaint that this is not the first time he had experienced a sham interview. This had happened before, but that time it was with the Broncos in 2019. In this interview, the general manager, John Elway, and the president's CEO, Joe Ellis, allegedly showed up one hour late looking disheveled, and it was obvious they had been drinking heavily the night before. The complaint alleges that their behavior during the interview made it clear that it was being conducted only because of the Rooney rule and with no intention to actually hire Flores as the head coach. These three allegations rock the world of sports and the aftermath of interviews, responses from the league and the teams, and discussions of the NFL's history with the discrimination were swift. Perhaps one of the most jarring responses came from the statement released from the NFL and the statement said, "'The NFL and our clubs are deeply committed to ensuring equitable employment practices and continue to make progress in providing equitable opportunities throughout our organizations. Diversity is core to everything we do and there are few issues in which our clubs and our internal leadership team spend more time. We will defend against these claims, which are without merit.'" The various teams all released similar statements that denounced the allegations against them. Flores went on a round of interviews following the release of the complaint. When asked by NPR how he had decided to file the lawsuit, Flores responded in part by saying, "'This isn't about me. "'This is about something that's much bigger than me, "'which is a system in the NFL that, in my opinion, "'is broken as far as hiring practices "'for black and minority coaches and minorities in general.'" Then a few days later, former head coach for the Browns, Hugh Jackson, who was also a black man, came out and suggested that he too had been offered additional compensation to lose games. Jackson told SportsCenter that the team had a four-year plan that incentivized him to lose the first two years so they could acquire draft picks and cap space. For the record, while Jackson was the head coach for the team in 2016 and 2017, they won one game out of the 31 they played. Jackson had previously filed a fraud grievance against the Browns in 2018 after he was fired, but it was dismissed. Now he is talking with Flores' lawyers and reportedly expressed a willingness to provide testimony and materials to Flores' lawsuit. As the story has picked up quick and strong momentum, the NFL has relatively backed off of their original statement that the claims were without merit. Goodall has released a follow-up statement saying that the claims were very disturbing and that the league does not tolerate racism. However, the league seems to be taking this lawsuit incredibly seriously as they recently hired the former US Attorney General Loretta Lynch to defend the NFL. Brian Flores has since received a job with the Steelers as a senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach. While it's great that he's back to coaching in the NFL, this is a huge downgrade from his head coaching job he had before. This situation is clearly still unfolding and there is undoubtedly more to come as both sides work to build their cases for their discovery. But the accusations that the NFL has been racially discriminatory is long running and the new allegations that coaches are being paid to throw games threaten the integrity of the sport of football itself. So as the lawsuit continues, it will certainly be interesting to see what this means for the NFL, the owners and many players in the league. So with all of that being said, that is where we're gonna end today's episode of The Corporate Casket and part two on the NFL. I hope you learned something new in this episode. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I know it's valuable and thank you for choosing, you know, the 30 minutes or so to be here with me. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day or night wherever you are in the world and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.